Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players, uncover their stories, and discover what makes them tick. If you love guitar, music, and the backstory of people's lives, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with Everyone Loves Guitar, and we've got one of the great Texas blues legends with us today. We're with Rocky Athis. He played with John Mayall's Blues Breakers for eight years. He's recorded with Buddy Miles, Stevie Ray Vaughan's Double Trouble, Glenn Hughes from Deep Purple, bass player, Joe Walsh, and others. He was also the lead guitar player for Black Oak, Arkansas for five years, and he's released eight solo albums of his own, including last year's Shake in the Dust, and we'll talk about that record today. At the beginning of his career, Rocky was the creative vortex, if if you will, behind a band called Lightning, which was one of the biggest draws in Texas nightclub history, and they regularly opened for national acts. By the age of 23, the Oak Cliff, Texas native had been included in Buddy Magazine's now legendary list of top guitarists, an honor he shared with Eric Johnson, Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan, Billy Gibbons of ZZ Top, of course, and Johnny Winter. Moving on from Lightning, Rocky began appearing as the lead guitarist for national acts, including, as I mentioned, Southern Rock, One of a Kind, Jim Dandy, and Black Oak, Arkansas. Two of Black Oak, Arkansas's greatest hits, Ready as Hell and Wild Bunch, were written by Rocky and feature his playing. While playing with Black Oak, Arkansas, Rocky was introduced to the Bolin brothers, drummer Johnny and, of course, Tommy Bolin of James Gang and Deep Purple. After Tommy's death, Rocky performed, toured, and recorded Tommy Bolin tribute shows with Johnny in support of the Tommy Bolin Archives Foundation. Tommy Bolin is one of my favorite guitar players, man. I don't know why his name don't come up more often than it does. Um, in the late 2000s, Rocky was made an offer he couldn't refuse. Of course, John Mayall, the godfather of British blues, asked him to play lead guitar on his next album. Needless to say, Rocky was honored to be recognized for his skill and thrilled to, jo to join Mayall's list of legendary players with the Blues Breakers. Former members included Eric Clapton, Peter Green, Jack Bruce, John McVie, Mick Fleetwood, and Mick Taylor. Within weeks of the call from Mayall, they were together in the studio working on the record. Rocky played with John for eight years, and then in September of 2016, John Mayall announced he'd reduce his performance format to a trio and become his own guitar player. He was 83 at the time, and this was something he'd always wanted to do. That's like really delaying your... Uh, <laughs> delaying your dreams, yeah, I'd say. Uh, yeah, it was. It was like, uh, I know he told me about that. He goes, you know, I uh, never really practiced on guitar, but he goes, it is fun. I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, but he had played guitar, you know, before, but he just said it was something that he was feeling. And what had happened was uh, – we were playing an outdoor festival. I don't remember what city now, <laughs> but uh, the uh, we had horrible storms here in Dallas, hmm. and it was with one nighter. And being a big outdoor festival, uh, I tried to get out, but they kept canceling flights and canceling flights. And we were trying. I was trying to fly out the day before the concert. Was this in England or? No, it would have been here in America. Okay. Um, and at 1230 at night, they said all flights are canceled. You know? uh, so I, I called them. They were already in the city. And John said, well, just be on standby and we'll fly you out in the morning. So I got up at like four in the morning, went to the airport because all these people couldn't fly out. They just all the flights were canceled. And at four in the morning, I, I went to the airport. And they got me on an airplane. Then the storm started coming again. We sat on the runway for an hour and a half. Oh, my God. And I texted him and I said, the show is today. We play at 2 o'clock. I don't think I'm going to make it because they're, they're sending me back to the gate. So we had to de, you know, de, deplane the airplane and everybody got off. And uh, it just took too long. The, the next flight out, I would have missed 
the show. So John said, well, you know, don't worry about it. I'll go ahead and just do it. And he said he ended up getting a kind of a charge from it, playing, you know, guitar and stuff. And so he said he wanted to try it. He said, I've never done it. And it's kind of the last part of my career. And I'd like to try that. So I said, you know, I understand, you know, it was a great run with you. And it was kind of an odd way to figure that out. But yeah. but uh, that was okay with me because it kind of got me started back on my own path. And uh, that's how that happened. Wow. Yeah, that's – you must have had a hundred things like what if and should I have left a day early. And But you don't know, man. That's the, the, the thing with life, man. You know, you just – Yeah, I did try to leave the day early. And it, it, all the flights were rained out and canceled there. So, you know, being a one nighter, we everybody was flying out the day before, but it yeah. just sort of fell that way. It's like a happenstance, and uh, so that was kind of unique. But, but I'm okay with it because yeah. it allowed me to focus again on what I'm doing. Yeah, I think I've got a good album now with Shaking the Dust. Great album, man. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, what was your first paying gig, Rocky, and how'd you get it? <laughs> that was, that's funny because. Uh, I was in the eighth grade, and uh, <laughs> that's funny. Eighth grade. We had a we had a drummer, and I had another rhythm player. We didn't have a bass player. <laughs> Can you imagine what that must have sounded like? And uh, so we had a guy that was on the football team, and his parents were going to be out of town, and he said he wanted to hire a band to play. And of course, we were scared to death, and we went, "Well, we'd have to make money." He said, "Well, I can give you twenty five dollars." Hmm. And uh, each so made, or split, but no, it was, split. split. Yeah, so we made eight bucks a piece. There you go, put a dollar in gas. Mm -hmm. And uh, then after that, we all went out and had pizza and blew all our money. But that was my <laughs> first paying gig. When That's I was awesome. In eighth grade, and it was at a house party. That's I still what? remember that as plain as day, man. That's funny. That's great. So, how'd you get connected with Jim Dandy and Black Oak, Arkansas? And what was that experience like? Well, I got connected with Jim by uh, my band Lightning. Mm. Uh, we were on tour with uh, Black Oak, Arkansas, and Wichita Falls, Fort Worth, Dallas, Austin. And they just happened to be getting rid of their guitar player, or he was quitting or something like that. And he, he said, would you like to uh, join the group? And I thought it was, yeah, why not? I mean, it was kind of fun, you know. Mm. And... Uh, so basically, he just saw me play and asked me to join. Were you still in Lightning at the time? Or did you just, like, how did that work? Well, I think Lightning was sort of at the end of the rope anyway. So, you know, yeah. I kind of pulled out and went, yeah, I'm ready. Good. Yeah, good. I'm ready to hit the road. Very cool. And that was a good experience as your first, like, yeah, it was. Uh, it was opening. Good. That's great, man. Did you, you know, you mentioned Tommy, and I said I love I love his playing. Just an incredible play. Did you get to play with him ever? No, I never got to play with him. I saw him open up for Jeff Beck, though, in Dallas. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tommy <laughs> Bolin opening up for Jeff Beck. Just the thought of a show like that. That's nuts, man. Wasn't it something? Man, my ears were ringing like hell, but I loved it. But um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, when I got with Johnny Bolin, Johnny Bolin was the drummer with Black Oak. That's how I met Johnny. Oh, okay. And... Uh, so I'd go to Johnny Bowen's house and it was the house that they were brought up in as kids. And Johnny left his room identical to the day that he left to go on tour. And that was in Colorado. They were right. No, Sioux city, Iowa. Okay. And, uh, he had moved back to Sioux city, but, um, it was really weird to see his velvet pants still hanging on the back of the door. And it was, I went in Tommy's room and was playing with this acoustic and just thinking, wow, this is, you know, this is really being close to it. Yeah. And you know, Johnny, Johnny looks just like Tommy. Oh, does he? Oh, I mean, spooky. It's spooky. If you look online, you'll go, he, that looks like Tommy. Uh, they almost look like twins. Wow. Yeah. But anyway, uh, that's how I met Johnny Bolin. And then it kind of branched off into, I already knew Glenn Hughes. From, from, from how? Uh, 
being in town and uh, I heard that Glenn Hughes had come in town and I ended up going to some kind of jam session and Glenn was there. So wait a minute, he was originally from England, correct? Yeah. And so he's he just in LA then. Oh, uh, okay. Oh, okay. well, he was living in Atlanta. I can't remember which one. But anyway, we befriended each other. And uh then when I got with Johnny, we thought it'd be really great to do a Tommy Bowling tribute because the songs were great. Oh, really good. Still love to hear it. And uh Johnny was like, I wonder if we could get Glenn Hughes to sing them because Glenn used to be with him in Deep Purple. And so we just contacted Glenn and he goes, sure, mate. <laughs> so he- we did we did several tours and we did an album. That's great, man. What a yeah. lineup. Yeah, Very it cool. Good. So the you, Glenn Hughes. Really wow. good. It's called, uh, it's 1999 Tommy Bowling tribute uh, from the blue, I think it was the Bluebird Theater in Colorado. And uh, wow, it sure was fun playing with Glenn. And I still talk to Glenn even last week. I mean, I, we stay in touch all the time. What, what was your favorite Tommy song to play? Oh, I used to love to, to play uh, uh, Post Toasty. No, I was just thinking in my head, post toasty. I swear, well, yeah. to, I swear to you, that's got the groove from hell. Oh you? man, what a great tune that is, man! I'm, yeah, I'm, I got good. goosebumps now, man. I was just th- oh, holy crap, that's wild, post man! Toasty, and uh, then I did a version of uh, Slow Driver. I don't know and, that one off the top of my head. Yes, yeah, because when Tommy wrote that, I heard the original tape, and. This is how I remember it, but it could be slightly wrong. Anyway, Tom, uh, Johnny showed it to me, and it was on a reel-to-reel, and it was just him sitting in the bedroom playing an acoustic doing Slow Driver. So all me and Johnny had ever heard was him just doing the song Slow Driver on an acoustic. We electrified it. And did it with Glenn, showed that to Glenn, and then we put it out. And then I ended up recording it for my <clears throat> Miracle album with Larry. So you uh, – So that must have been pretty cool to, to, to do a Tommy song. Yeah, and it really wasn't heard at the time by the common public because it was uh, – Never, it wasn't out yet. It was just, you know, like sitting in your bedroom there and you, hey, I got an idea for a song. Sure. But you could hear, I know he would have recorded it later if he wouldn't have died. But uh, you can hear everything you need to hear in his acoustic version of that song. So all we did was just beef the hell out of it, torque it out. And it came out really well. You should listen to it if you haven't heard my version of Slow Driver. I will, man. Let me write it down right here. Yeah, there should be a video of me playing it. It's a tribute to him. I played my Gibson Explorer. <laughs> Very cool. He only played a Strat, right, if I remember correctly? That's all he played. Well, he did, but in, in the Zephyr days and some of the days after that, he had a Explorer. But it was an Ibanez, but still a great one. Hmm. Yeah, I really dug his playing, man. And I, he's in my regular rotation. Absolutely. But yeah. yeah, discover that. Now you can go out and hear the original version of Slow Driver. Oh, they re- they wound up releasing it. Yeah. Unreleased music that he did. And they started releasing anything. That's what a lot of people do, man. They, I mean, in a lot of it, not, nothing against the Bolin family, of course, but just in general, a lot of this stuff you hear it is like, man, there's a reason why it was unreleased. Unre- <laughs> I haven't heard that. So I'm not saying that's it, but many, like a lot of the Hendrix stuff, it's like, yeah, it wasn't ready, man. Yeah, you know, as, man, come on. As an artist, a lot of times we just jot down the idea with our instrument. Sure. And we didn't really use our best handwriting on it yet. You know, we just – it's it's kind of sucks when they do that, but, you know, people want to hear it. I guess, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, take a listen to it. It's called Slow Driver. I think you'll really like it. I played an Explorer on it. It kind of had a good tone. Um. How'd you initially wind up getting hooked up with Mayall and what was that experience like? And can you share like maybe a cool or interesting story about working with him? Okay. Uh, well, I had done an opening show with John. We opened up for Mayall. 
I didn't hear anything. We didn't really talk. Who was his guitar player at that time? Buddy Whittington. Okay. And about four years later, uh, he said he was in England and heard my song on the BBC, one of my songs. Went, Who's that guitar player? And then uh, he went and to, to some venue or something like that. A lot has been distorted since then, but he heard uh, he heard somebody playing one of my CDs over the uh, PA. Who is that? He goes, a guy named Rocky Athos. I remember Rocky Athos. He opened up for us. And like four years later, he gave me a call out of nowhere. And he had gotten my phone number from my webmaster at the time. That's so wild. And I, it was kind of funny because I got a call from John Mayall, but uh, I didn't know he was going to call. And then after I received the call, my webmaster goes, oh, yeah, man, I think John Mayall wants to get in touch with you. I went, <laughs> yeah, I know that. <laughs> well, I was driving down the highway, and the phone rang. It said unavailable. And uh, usually I don't answer those because, you know, it's like oh, it's, it's, it's by, like, by the Dallas Times or something. Have yeah. you got life insurance? I hope yeah. so. <laughs> but uh, so there's this guy on the other end. Hello, Rocky. <laughs> That's how you said my name, Rocky. Um, and I said, oh, Brian, shut up. <laughs> See, I had a friend who could copy Glenn Hughes' voice to a T. And he said Rocky just the same way Glenn Hughes did. He said, hello, Rocky. And uh, so I thought it was Brian Parker, a friend of mine. That's funny, man. And uh, I said, oh, Brian, shut up. <laughs> And all of a sudden, on the other line, he goes, excuse me? I went, because I didn't know John was going to call. Sure. And I'm driving down the freeway, and he goes, this is John Mayall. And I'm calling you from, I think he was in the Netherlands at that time. And I went, wow, how you doing? (laughs) (laughs) And he said, well, what I was doing, I heard your stuff. And he goes, I went out and bought your CDs, and I love them. And, uh, And then he said, I also remember you opening up for me. And he said, uh, I'm looking to start a new band, and I'd love for you to come out and do a new album with me, tour, make a little money. And and he said, would you be interested? And I went, yes. <laughs> I hung up and went, that was unique. Yeah, that was. But it was so funny how <laughs> I thought it was Brian, and I told him to shut up. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure. Look, I mean, he would be foolish not to understand that. You know, I mean, you're not expecting John unless he thought your guy told you. But I'm sure he knew. I mean, you know. Well, when he asked for my number, he didn't even give my guy time to let me know he was going to call. Oh, he just called you right away. Yeah, I guess so. Because Mark, my webmaster at the time, said, hey, man, I was going to tell you that John Mayall's trying to get in touch with you. And I went, he already did. Wow. <laughs> but, what a cool phone kind of, call. Huh? What a cool phone call. Yeah, it was. And, and so he said uh, – I'd love for you to play guitar with me. And it ended up being uh, almost eight years. You know, I did a lot of albums with him. I did a live DVD in London. Uh, We had two albums, had several double albums. But yeah, it was just awesome playing with John because he was and still is such a legend. So my time with John was really fun. Did you ever ever have any of the old male guitarists come on stage and guest, you know, play with you and because they were in town or whatever? Oh, yeah, I did with uh, Mick Taylor several times. Wow. Yeah. And Mick and I became kind of friends. Uh, We've talked since. At one time, we were going to do a tour together with my band and his, but it just didn't work out. They could only get like two dates and it wasn't enough to for me to go over there or. No, two dates. Yeah, that ain't like, that ain't gonna, that's just they not just going to pay your uh, flight with all your guys, man. Yeah, so they just couldn't get it to work out. But that's uh, too bad. I, I think he, when Mick was with the Stones, in my opinion, that's the best Rolling Stones version you got ever. That. I mean, you got honestly, that. You, you listen to Sticky Fingers. That's like a perfect record, man. Yeah, you know the the tones and his <sighs> note selection on all that stuff. 
only step them up about 10 feet. I mean, you yeah, listen to like this, the end of can't you hear me? I mean, the whole thing, his whole thing in can't you hear me knocking, but that, I know that it's just so mo- moving. It's not like super complicated, but it's just so cool. It's perfect. Yeah. It's right. perfect for the song. Yeah. It's got a lot of air. Yep. Tons of air. That's why it's so good because all the other cool parts can go in between yeah. the air. You know, it's like, that's something that is awesome about those cats that write great songs. You know, they, they leave a lot of air in the song. So <clears throat> other things can happen. That's you a lead guitar them. player serving the song for sure, man. Yeah. That's- yeah. So it was a lot of fun playing with Mick. <clears throat> and there's a, it's kind of weird. There's an actual, uh, video of us playing together on YouTube, kind of hard to find, but it sounds terrible as far as the quality. Somebody just had a phone and, you know, it does never sound very good, but I hear that a lot from guys I interview and they're like, man, I can't stand it. You know, somebody will put a video of me up and they, you know, they use the, you know, a phone or whatever, and it was out in the back or whatever. And then people send me email. Oh God, doesn't, don't, don't you know how to have a sound system or, and it's like, you know, it's not me. I'm not making the recording. I didn't put it out there. It's it's amazing that the listener sometimes doesn't realize directional and that if somebody's right in front of your amp with a telephone, that's the only thing they're going to hear. Well, especially the the video it doesn't say Rocky Athis, I guarantee you. You know, I mean from your channel, you could see it's not you that posted it, right? So I mean it's right. not- Well people don't read. <laughs> they really don't. Yeah, I know. But that's fine. Uh, but yeah, it was a lot of fun playing with him and playing with Jeff Beck. I got to know Jeff real well. Um that was only awesome as hell. What was that like playing with Beck? I, I interviewed a couple of his guitar players and I said, How does he do what he did? And both of them it was two uh, women, uh, Carmen Vandenberg, like the yeah. last couple of tours ago, and then Jennifer Batten, of course, who's a yeah. brilliant guitar player. And they both were like, you know, I sat and watched Jeff. You know, Jennifer was with him for like three years, and uh, so I have no idea. I still don't know. And well, it's interesting. The he, same. He's kind of close to the chest when it comes to uh, giving up secrets or whatever you're trying to find out. I just think he's just – open to going a little further than other guitar players, but he does like to talk shop. You know, when we talk Les Pauls and we talk strats and, you know, things like that, it was a lot of fun talking with him, you know, because then he was like talking to one of your musician friends. Sure. You know, yeah. people, people didn't want anything from him as, you know, we're just talking about gear and most musicians kind of, Love doing that. Sure. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Somebody, you know. Most guitar players anyway. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. man. Yeah. That was a lot of fun playing with him. That's great, man. Very cool. Um, Let's talk about your last record, Shaking the Dust. It was released okay. October of 17. Great rock and blues album. 11 solid tracks. And I just have a, some questions about the record and about my two favorite tracks. Was anything different for you when you set out to make this record? Well, I just wanted it to not have keyboards. I, I, even though I did use some, uh, I wanted it to be a little more. Doesn't mean I'm going to do it again on the next album. I might get another keyboard player. I don't know yet. But I just wanted it to be all guitar, like back in the days when you'd hear a great Johnny Winter album. <laughs> Gee whiz. You remember that live album of them? J- uh, Johnny Winter out? and with the, and, three, the, yeah, the, the, the three sides? That's God, like, you, I had to go to instantly start doing push ups. <laughs> you know, it's like, one, okay, I'm going to do it. One of the greatest records ever. And for some reason, I was feeling that. That's what I was feeling when I did the album is I want a little more energy. Uh, and not a lot of production, but, you know, I mean, I double tracked and stuff, but, you know, I, I kind of was looking for that direction where, it's, you know, a lot of guitar. And uh, so I felt like I captured it pretty good. Yeah, you did. It's great. It's it's a great rock and blues album. Man. It's good. good it's guitar, man. It's it's. Um, where where did you record that? Well, I recorded it at two different places. I uh, recorded it at uh, Walter Hill Studios in Grand Prairie, Texas, and then I recorded 
the other part and the mix at Jim Gaines studio. And, uh, I believe it's called Bessie blue studios. And, uh, Jim Gaines, you know, what a producer, I mean, you know, he did Santana, Jim, Stevie Ray Vaughan, um, you name it. He's done them. Shoot. He did uh, tower of power, uh, Steve Miller. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah, the guy just he done Huey Lewis in the news. He's Journey. He's done all the number one hit guys. And me and him became songwriting partners. Jim Gaines and I. Was, and uh, if you listen to, uh, I've got a song on uh, <clears throat> the Voodoo Moon album called Road Fever. And Jim Gaines and I wrote that. Very cool. Yeah. So it was a lot of fun working with him. And I think having a good producer helps a lot. Because sometimes you get a little close to the song and you yeah. think this is really cool. And he goes, boy, that part really, really sucks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and you go, does it? And he goes, well, it kind of gets in the way of everything. <laughs> so you, you're you not a guy that's going to go make a – in someone's home studio. You are going you like going into a proper studio with a – Well, if they, both of them are home studios. Okay. They're just nice. Yeah, okay. They're out to the side of the house. <laughs> but you yeah. need a produ- – you want a producer. Yes. Yeah. Mm. I sure do, and I, I, uh, I, I enjoyed recording the album. So you know, and I used like five different guitars. Let's say I used three thirty-five Strat, the Tele. I used a Rickenbacker on one rhythm. I used a Gibson Dove and uh, a Takamini. You know, it's just kind of fun using different guitars. Yeah. You know, and then I had a couple that were homemade guitars on a couple tracks that a guy had built for me, a guy named uh, John Youngman, and and uh, he made an uh, Indian guitar, killer guitars. Very cool. Yeah, I, I used his. Did you record all together, or did you do you did your tracks? And some of them we did. Okay. Yeah, some of them we did. Uh, like instrumental solo, we did that live hmm. on the spot. The or Villanova Junction, the last track on yeah. Sick in the Dust. We did that one completely live. And uh, Dictator, we did the rhythm track live. And then, of course, we added the, <laughs> all the extras. But, uh, yeah, it was a heck of a lot of fun doing that. And uh, that's kind of how I like to record where we're all – the rhythm section is together. And I at least lay the rhythm part down. Sometimes I'll take a chance at a lead and just keep that one. Mm. Then come back and put a rhythm behind it. Sure, but uh, I just wanted it to have the live feel a little bit too, you know. Yeah, that's what I figured you'd like that. Yeah, and uh, so it came out pretty good. I used an interesting amp on that album. What'd you use? I was going to ask you that. I used a uh, 1969 Fender Twin. Why, why is that interesting for you? Well, because I usually love Lab L- uh, Lab Series L fives. Mm-hmm. And uh, I like the Red Knob Twins. These things are kind of vintage. But when I heard the sound of this uh, 69 Fender Twin, I was like going, wow, that's clean when you want it to be. And then when you <clears> – I had it really loud. <laughs> I had it up on about eight. But, you know, nobody was yelling at me. So I guess that was <laughs> It's funny because when your wife sent stuff to me, she goes – Make sure you play it loud. <laughs> so yeah. that's an Athos thing, man. It's it's in the family, I guess, right? Well, there's energy in that. Oh, to tons, me. tons. Uh, but yeah, so I used that, and uh, if I ever wanted it to distort, I would just hit that little, you know, Ibanez tube screamer, and it would just fatten up. And the, but the rhythm was still clean. Hmm. But it was, but it was, it had a lot. So I mean, I got a kick out of using a twin for the whole album. Let me ask you a question about a couple of tracks. Um, let's talk about Villanova Junction since you mentioned it. Okay. I, this, this is my notes. This is basically a four-minute blues guitar clinic. <laughs> I mean, that was a great, great track, man. Were you playing a Strat on there, though, right? No, you're going to freak when you hear this. What were you playing? I was playing a 1954 Black Beauty on the front pickup with the wow Mac, with the staple pickups. You know, the they're like P90s, but... The front of it has the uh, staple pickup. What does that look? What, what do you mean a staple pickup? I don't think I know that. Well, if you look at like a '54 Black Beauty, 
it has a P90 in the bridge, and then in the front it has what we call the staple pickup, but it's the same size as a P90. And uh, from what I understand, it's an old jazz pickup. Wow. I, that sounded like a Strat, man. That was wild. Man, and I'll tell you the reason why I decided to do that was when I was a kid, I was lucky enough to see Jimi Hendrix three times. And That's amazing. Yeah. One time I went in my baseball uniform because it was the only way I could get there. <laughs> <in time. laughs> Which I'm sure looked really great. But uh, he was playing – as I later found out, a 1954 Black Beauty, and I watched him do Red House on it, and he only used that front pickup, and I used to think, God, that sounds good. And all these years later, I thought, you know, I'm going to do Villanova Junction. I know he did it with a Strat at Woodstock, but I thought, I want to try and fatten it a little bit like he did Red House. And so that's that's actually a 1954 Black Beauty. Is that your guitar? Or is that something Jim had lying around the studio? No, it's mine. Yeah, that's it's great, fun. man. Wow. Yeah. That's phenomenal, man. I have a and then uh, Time Flies. This really starts up really pretty acoustic track. And then um, to me, it's like a great rock anthem, that song. Good. It kind of is. Um, it didn't start that way. It just was going to be solid acoustic. But then we started adding stuff. And it it just seemed like those tones were supposed to be on it. Hmm. You know what I mean? And I actually used a baritone guitar on those low rhythms. You know, when you hear them kind of go, blong, blong. That's you know, a baritone. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, all it did was beef up the regular six string. So it all sounds like one guitar, but it's a baritone mixed with a regular 335 hitting those chords. So it just sort of blended really nice. I give you credit. You got a pretty big catalog, man. That's not, it's not, it's not easy, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It's tough to crank out all these records, man. Well, you know, it's just laying ideas down and you know, the key to it is having studio access and not having to rush and do an album in five days. Yeah. But you that's know, a lot of work and time and money and commitment and discipline. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, and you know, you got to, you may take the song home for two days and go, God, that sounds great the way we did it. Let's just leave it. Or you go, oh, I got to get rid of that track. What was I thinking? <laughs> you know, yeah. that's the beauty of it. And you don't get stuck with it forever. It's almost like not holding your gut in in a picture. <laughs> you know, you go, oh, I wish I'd have held my gut in. Yeah, that's funny, man. I, that's a funny analogy. Hey, you've been um, you've been involved in so many different projects. Is it possible for you to pick like top three experiences f- uh, any reason could be the hang. It could be the, the music it could be your performance. Well, um, one of the coolest experiences I had was in the terrible. I don't remember what city it was, but it was in England. We were doing a tour of England and it might've been in Wales. I'm not real sure, but John came up to me and John said, uh, John Mayall. And he said, uh, Peter Green's here. I was like, cool. Wow. And he said, so those songs where I said, I'm going to play guitar, he goes, I ain't doing it tonight. Oh, <laughs> so goes, you- I want to switch the songs set up and, you know, you just take it. I went, okay. And having Peter Green sit right in front of me and give me a thumbs up was really pretty cool. Have you seen that? You know, because uh- he was, I loved Peter Green. Oh, God, yeah. And, uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say, well, I better clean up or shut up, you know, because, I mean, it wasn't like he was out there taking notes. It's just that he was enjoying the night, and I felt real good about that. That's great. But he man. stayed till the very end of the night, so must not have bored him too bad. <laughs> uh, have you yep, seen the doc? You're not moving anybody, and they just get up and go. And you go, well, that didn't work. <laughs> no, no, man. I'm sure he wouldn't. Uh, have yeah. you Have you seen the documentary on him? On uh, Amazon Prime. Not yet. Yeah, it's pretty good, actually. I'm like almost all the way through it. It's pretty he might interesting. Be my favorite rock blues player. Maybe. Really good player, man. Hard to say because Clapton did such great stuff. You know, they're all they're all great. When you just you know, and to me it's not really about the lead break. It really isn't. It's about the song and the sound. You know, because there's players that can just sit there and play chops over and over and over and not repeat themselves. 
But the song, is that something you want to ride around and listen to? You know, and you want the song to me, the way I grew up with it is I want to sing along with it in my head. I want to flow with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so to me, it was always about the song. You know, when it came to Hendrix or if it came to Cream or, uh, you know, Fleetwood Mac, I still think, oh, Wells. Oh, man, what a great song. Man, what a perfect marriage between a – it's either a Strat on the back pickup or it's a Telly. I can't tell. But what a great marriage when that acoustic's doing that riff and then the treble end of some kind of fender comes in with it. You go, whoa, whoa wow, that EQ'd beautifully. Yeah, great song, <laughs> you know, man. It just laid in the track. It was sonically perfect. He wrote so many good songs in a short time, but it was such a short time. I think that's why he's kind of – not as well, they're good ones. Oh, they're great. Yeah I, play, yeah. I got to play with Peter Green a few times other than the time he came to watch and, uh, kind of hard to get to know, you know, he doesn't talk a lot, but it was cool. It was cool watching him play. He kind of mocked the guitar he was playing that day. Cause, uh, he said, Oh, it's not one of the vintage ones. It's just a crummy new one. <laughs> just a crummy new last Paul. Yeah, yeah, it was one of those vintage lines, and he said it's just a crummy new one. <laughs> oh, it was like a reissue or something? Yeah, he's just so brutally honest. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> you still made it sound great. What, what was what were the other two top experiences? Playing with playing in front of Peter would be your first, you said? Oh, I thought that was pretty cool, yeah. Um, I would say uh, actually getting to record with Double Trouble and Buddy Miles was a lot of fun. Wow. And T talk know, about that. Just, well, it was just really cool being able to, uh, well, nobody plays blues and shuffles like they do yeah. together. Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton were so good at that stuff. And it, it kind of made you step up a little bit, you know? So I really enjoyed that tremendously. And, you know, we toured with that record for about, about a year or something like that. And then Buddy got really, really sick, had a stroke and collapsed in the front yard. And then we tried to go back out and do a few more shows without Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton. And uh, he just uh, was having a real hard time and ended up, I did the last gig with Buddy in Florida. Oh, wow. Died about two weeks later, something like that. And, uh, he had a little bit of a hard time remembering the words, things like that, because of the stroke. Oh man! So the the uh, <clears throat> the last experience was it was still a lot of fun playing with Buddy. Sure. You know, but uh, yeah, he didn't never really quite recovered from that last stroke. Mm, too so bad. Was kind of but the album that we did, the Bluesberries, turned out really nice. I mean, I still love rock and roll, the blues, and the Freddie King tribute that we did. Um, just good songs, you know, and Muddy Water Blues, Compassion for the Blues. You know, we did a lot of those tracks right on the spot because that's the way Buddy liked to do it. He sang it, and he was, you know, he just did it. We did it right on the spot. There was no overdubs or anything. You know, and Compassion for the Blues, it's completely live. And then a of course, some of the others, we added some extra guitar tracks. But, yeah, it was totally cool doing that. Was Tommy and Chris like one of the best rhythm sections I'd imagine that you've ever played with? For that kind of music, yes. Texas blues, Texas shuffles, stuff like that, they drove it. And for you as a good guitar player, all you had to do was just play inside of it. Yeah, the jump rope, man. You know, you're right in the groove. You're going. <laughs> it's hard to get off. <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah, That's so really it, cool. It made uh, doing sessions right on the spot real easy. Yeah, you know, because it all bounced, and you go, "Well, I can't do that better." Right, right. And there was something about watching this body English on the drums. You know, Chris. Yeah, that you could kind of feed off of. Like I know that's coming, so. I <laughs> That's you know, really cool. Yeah, so that was a lot of fun doing that record. That that was really great. And then the, the others being with John Mayall. Yeah. 
and uh, one of my favorite albums I did with John was uh, It's a Special Life. Uh, I mean, I got a lot of rave reviews being on the album, which really helped me out a lot. But uh, I always enjoyed the experience of playing with John. And uh, so I hold that close to, to myself, you know, that, that it was a great experience and not a lot of guys got to do that. And, you know, that was, a, that was awesome. I never worked that hard in my life though. Really? And okay. So what, talk about that in what way? Well, when we went out to tour, you didn't have any nights off somehow. He's like a road. I mean, he's just a road dog, man. I mean, he can get it. So what we do is we'd start and we'd play like 20 days straight maybe have a day off for travel, get back on the horse again and go like 15 days. He never, ever hardly wow. had any days off. So if we went out and played 62 days, we played like 55 days in that 62. A lot of that was travel days in the 62 days I was gone. That's a rough, that's tough, yeah. man. But man, you sure get your chops up. <laughs> Let me ask you something as a, as a, as a good guitar player when you were playing with him was there a certain appeal that he has why you could see how other over the years that's other guitar players as well have gravitated to him um like you know you got, there's got to be this is everything in a nutshell is if it didn't really have a groove john didn't want to do it so if it's got a groove, you're at least going to be able to play well to it. Now, whether you write a good melody line comes later, but he was always aware that we got to have a good groove here. <laughs> so it kept you on your best game. And I think I took a little of that with me, you know, because I try to make sure all my songs have a groove, but I've, I've been trying to do that for years. Um, it's just that it was nice to play with somebody that, if we were doing a song and it wasn't grooving, eh, let's go to the next. You know, there's others yeah. to do. And, and so, you know, that was pretty cool. That was just, to me, that's what it was great about working with John was all of them had a groove so you could play great to them. Yeah. Nothing was a complicated uh, mess, you know, with, yeah. with off timing and things like that. So if you think about it, it you think about all his albums, his song, everything is very straight ahead rocking, yeah. man. Yeah, that's very, yeah, it's, I never thought, really thought about that, but that's a very, a, a very strong consistency amongst everything he's put out. It's like, yeah. it's moving it, from the opening to the closing. Yeah, very yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's uh, and that's the same thing with Stevie Ray. I mean, when you listen to all his, yes, whether it's Cold Shot or any of those, you go, whoa, what a good groove. Yeah, very much I mean, so. Grooves that normal people like. Yeah. Um, some musicians may get tired of it, you know, especially, you know, if you really want to add a lot of notes and you're maybe wanting to get super busy, it might bore you. But my thought is, is I play for the listener. Mm -hmm. And I want the listener to grab a hold of what I'm trying to express. And I think that's a good way of doing it. Oh, yeah. It's a great way of doing it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, is to actually give them a groove they can hold. And then on top of that, you leave a lot of holes in the song so that you can have a good melody line. You got to let the singer sing. And there has to be a good hole in there for him to be able to sing well. If you're doing a bunch of notes, where's the singer fit? Man, you know what? As you're saying that, and I'm thinking about, you know, I listened to three of your albums and everything – that you're saying is very consistent with what you've done musically because every it's everything grooves. It's it, there's not a lot of, it's low stress, not a lot of pressures, a lot of openings and it's, and it's very tangible, very accessible uh, to the Same listener. With lead breaks. When you can play in the holes, which was good about playing with Chris Layton and all those guys like that in a groove like that, you'll have those sections where it's just wide open for you to do something cool. Yeah. But, Nothing is worse than trying to play with musicians that are all walking on top of each other hmm. 
you know, let me out play you and literally you go, where do I fit in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it you causes know? stress. Music is stressful. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine trying to be a good singer with that going on. You know, um, do you know a guy named Cliff Goodwin by any chance? No, I do not. So Cliff was Joe Cocker's guitarist and MD, uh, I think either mid early to late seventies or mid seventies or early eighties. Anyway, I interviewed Cliff and one of the things he said that stuck with me, he said, you know, Craig, uh, nobody ever won a Grammy because of the snare drum. He said, if you don't have a proper melody and a singer carrying that melody, you got no song. And that's exactly said- consistent with what you're talking about, man. Yeah. You got to let the singer sing. And how do you do that? It, it might even simplify your guitar part. Yeah. But you've got to let him sing or they won't like the song. It'll just be, my friends all told me that you're going to come on. You know, you go, oh, oh totally. Yeah. And, you know, I was going to get that. You get that? <laughs> you no, know, totally, you man. And, uh, but then when it's time for your lead break, where you've got all this room and space, you can show them what you got. Yeah, totally. But oh man, why, you're you're ripping it yeah, off. Why would you want to do that while the guy's trying to sing? It's no. kind of like, you know, trying to talk to somebody and they're tapping on your shoulder the whole time. Yeah, dad. dad, dad. <laughs> no, that's, I, that's exactly what it's like. Yeah, man, that's a good yeah. point. That's a real good point. Um, Rocky, what were some of the low points for you, or the more challenging times of your career, and and how did you manage to get through them? And how did you like fight off any any negative thoughts you might have had at the time about you know leaving the business, doing whatever? Well, I think when my mother got Alzheimer's. Oh wow, that's heavy. Yeah, that was a real drag for me, and I kind of slowed down a little bit so that I could be around to help my dad. Yeah, and this is before they really we're knowing a whole lot about Alzheimer's. It was in the early nineties and uh, we just didn't know how to handle it because, you know, she would just walk out the door and you go, where'd mom go? You know? So that was real hard on us. It really was. That's tough. My brain just wasn't in creative mode for those two years. That was the lowest I ever was. And when I tried to play guitar, you know, I'd play, you know, just, but I wasn't in a creative mood. You know, then I did went after mom died. Oh, boy, did I get in the creative move. But that's because she told me to. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, you're close with your mom. Yeah. Her spirit yeah. told me to, you know. That's great, man. That's great. Well, I'm sorry you had to do that. That is. That yeah. was the low point. That's, if you're talking that's... about life and career, it's like people were wanting to do gigs and stuff. And I was going, nah, I got to be around here from my dad. You know, my dad doesn't know how to handle this. And it aged my dad like 10 years, you know, because she. <laughs> She just, yeah, yeah, it's just got rough. There's no frame of reference for handling stuff like that at all. <laughs> no, you see, there's no handbook on no, it. No, there's. It's really difficult. I've had stuff, not Alzheimer's, but other stuff like that, and it's really, um, very, very stressful. Extremely yeah. stressful on the family. Completely helpless. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, man. So that would have been the lowest point, but uh, you know, there's always another. You know, you get through that stuff and you yeah. learn. And then, you know, like I said, mom inspired me, believe it or not. <laughs> oh, that's great. I certainly she came believe to me. She came to me in a dream and was whispering in my ear. What did she say? I couldn't completely make it out, but it was more or less, I'm okay. Man, that probably gave you a ton of peace. A lot of it I didn't understand, but I heard it, I'm okay. And that kind of got me. Wow. That was like, she's telling me that now you're okay. Yeah. She's okay. You're okay. When she was down, I was concerned for her. So that was, that was a rough period. But when she kind of gave me the green light, it was like, oh, cool. You know, no, that's time, great, man. Time to get busy and get my mind active again, you know? Sure. Man, well, thank you for sharing that. That was very cool. I'm sorry you had to go through that, but thank you for oh, sharing. Oh, thank you. Um, forgot the town that you grew up in Oak Cliff. You grew up in Oak Cliff. What was your childhood like? Well, the childhood was great. When I was young, I was actually an athlete. And then the Beatles had to get on TV. I (laughs) freaked out and went, whoa, what was that? (laughs) I know today, you know, in today's time, 
looking at the Beatles in 1964, because I was only like eight years old. And uh, looking at the Beatles today, you go, oh, well, it's kind of funny haircut, you know. But back then, we all had crew cuts. And nobody had, what is that? <laughs> you know, plus their sound was so captivating. That's what got me started playing music was holding a guitar. And that's where I grew up with Stevie Ray Vaughan at LK Hall School. He was in the fifth grade and I was in the fourth. That's why. And that's how we struck a friendship. I was in a talent show and uh, he was sitting on the front row with his class and he was smiling and he came to me afterwards. He goes, Hey, I play guitar too, man. And uh, he actually helped me take my, this is a funny story, but he actually helped me take my amp home that day. I had an Epiphone Comet amplifier and an ES-330 Gibson that my mother had bought me. Wow. That's yeah, pretty cool. Grade. But see, my brother was already an accomplished player. So, uh, A guitar guitarist? Yes. Yeah, okay. And uh, actually, getting off that story, my brother taught me how to play guitar, and I'll always be thankful to Nick for that, my brother. Good for your brother, man. Good for you guys. And uh, he still plays guitar. Uh, but uh, just Stevie... Well, actually, we called him Steve back then. We never said Stevie. But uh, Steve helped me take my amp home. And I was pulling it in my red wagon. <laughs> that, was my, that was my transportation for taking my amp to grade school. Of course. The only way I could get it there was my mother said, well, put it in your wagon. I went, that's a lot easier than carrying it. Oh, my God, yeah. So put it in the wagon along with the guitar. It would just drug it behind me. That's so and cool. Steve Stevie was walking with me. We were talking music and the whole bit and went all the way to the house. And then I walked back to school with him and his folks came back and got him. We called him on the phone or whatever it was. And uh, so I thought that was a good experience, you know, to remember. Yeah. We, we were that young when we knew each other. And actually, Stevie taught me how to play House of the Rising Sun. <laughs> Very cool. I had it worked up so wrong in the fourth grade. I was like, <laughs> so I got this. I, I probably was playing an A major instead of an A minor or something crazy, you know? Yeah, yeah. And he goes, man, I know exactly how to play that. And he grabbed my guitar and I was going, wait a minute, show it to me. So that was cool about growing up in Oak Cliff is we all traded licks. Yeah. And even as we started getting older, eighth grade, 10th grade, 11th grade, we'd go to these things called jam sessions that other high schools were having. And Steve would call me and go, hey, man, there's a jam session over at Sunset High School. So I bought, I remember borrowing my brother's Tempest Le Mans car. That's so funny. And he said, don't you wreck it. Anyway, I drove by and picked up Steve. And I honked it in the front. You know, gang, gang, it's time to go. I've got my guitar in the back. And he goes, come in. Well, he wasn't ready yet. He had to put his boots on. You know, he had to look cool. Mm -hmm. I think it's dingo boots or something. <laughs> something weird like that. And uh, he had his brother's Les Paul on the bed. Oh, wow. Jimmy's Les Paul. Yeah. And I remember thinking, wow, that sure is ugly. Because <laughs> it was so old. I wasn't used to If it was old, it was old. If it was new, you loved it. Oh, uh, so, okay. I remember I'd be like in the eighth. I was like in the 10th grade. So I just remember thinking, oh, God, it's so green and got all those cracks all over it. <laughs> That's what we love now. Yeah, yeah, of course. Anyway, funny. so Stevie said, listen to this lick I just learned. And I, I don't remember what lick it was, but I do remember he had rubber sole on his turntable. And that record was warped because it was like turning like this. Remember that? Yeah. I've just seen a face. I could forget the time. <laughs> He's still listening to it. And, uh, so he showed me the riff, and I go, wow, that's cool. He goes, well, man, let's go. And he took the guitar, and he threw it back on the bed, and it hit the bed post. It went boom, boom, like that. And we heard Jimmy in the background go, Steve. Oh, my God. Anyway, he goes, let's get out of here. <laughs> so we got in the car, and we left. And uh, they weren't going to let us play at this other high school jam session. Why? Because we went to Kimball. It was another high school. Okay. So – we were like going, well, let's at least watch. Stevie goes, that sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they blew one of their guitar amps. 
And they said, well, we might have to, I mean, anybody got a guitar amp? Stevie goes, I got my silver tone. So we went back out to the car and got it. And he said, I'll let y'all use it if you let me jam. Oh, clever. And he did. He sat down and he forgot to bring a strap. There's a couple of pictures of that floating around. He's sitting on the gym floor doing just boogie. That's wild. Yeah, with an old Telecaster he brought. But uh, wow. it's a very interesting story. Like 30 years later, might have, no, no, I'd say it'd be about 35 years later, I was at a Beatle collector's house. And he also collected things of Stevie Ray Vaughan. And he had a pair of shoes that Stevie owned. And he had. A, it wasn't a, that guy who wrote the book, was it? No, that was Craig Hopkins. Craig, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, but uh, this was a guy who owned Pepperland out in, in Irving, Texas. Well, anyway, he was a big time collector. And now this is really a true story. It's just how weird things happen. This would have been. Well, you know, like when I sit, when I saw when I came over to his house, I was like in the tenth grade, and he was playing Rubber Soul. I remember the record was just morbidly warped, <laughs> and so he has. He said, "I've got some of Stevie's old records and everything," and and he always used to write Steve Vaughn, you know, on his records. And I said, well, "Let me go through them." And when I got to that Rubber Soul, I said, "Man, I'm not going to open this, but I want you to." Is that record? grossly warped he pulled it out and he goes son of a bitch it is wow and i went that had to be the rubber soul he was listening. and he put steve vaughn on all his albums that's yeah. funny steve wow vaughn. that's uh you know you don't want somebody swapping them or anything you know yeah right right <laughs> but uh oh man he didn't take very good care of records but uh it was kind of funny because uh that record was warped he goes none of the other records are warped he goes, how would you know that? I go, it's a long story, dude. Wow. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah, but that really did happen. I thought that was kind of a funny little happenstance, you know? Did you ever get to play with, with him as an adult? Not really. Only about till we got in the 12th grade. Yeah. That's when we uh, kind of stopped jamming, and I'll tell you why. Because, well, actually, one time we did at Armadillo headquarters. I take that back. Another good story with that. But anyway, uh, that was after we got out of high school and I was doing lightning and he was playing with either Storm or one of the other bands he was with. And uh, Cobras? It could have been. I, I can't remember because, you know, he kind of went in and out of them there for a little while. Blackbird, people like that. Um, but uh, – he went to Sunset. I mean, I'm sorry. He went to Kimball and I went to Kimball. But when he left my junior year, he moved instantly to Austin, Texas. He started playing with his brother on bass. Okay. I didn't know that. And uh, so at that point, we kind of lost a little bit of touch with each other from, you know, I did, I'd see him like once a year or something if I came through Austin and stuff like that. And, sure. You know, one time uh, Stevie – came to Armadillo headquarters when we were playing there and I wanted him to play my original cherry sunburst. And he goes, you know, I think they're pretty guitars, but, uh, I got a really cool Stratocaster. And, uh, he said, well, this one plays good. You know, so he's sitting there playing it. And there was this guy that used to collect union dues, a guy named Nick in local four, three, three in Austin, Texas. And, uh, I joined that particular union myself. Um, because it was cheaper than Dallas's. <laughs> but uh, he was there collecting dues from the musicians. And he came in the room and asked to collect from me. And when Stevie saw him coming, he said, he handed me back the guitar and he goes, dude, don't let him know I'm here. And he ducked behind the couch. And Nick, I gave him the money. He goes, have you seen Steve around? Steve Vaughn? And I went, no, I haven't. And after he walked off, he hopped up and he goes, that motherfucker, <laughs> <laughs> he hadn't hit one note. That's He's so, always taking our money. <laughs> that's so funny. Oh, my God. But he owed, uh, Stevie owed him something like 6 or $7 from his last Armadillo performance. And, right, right. And that's back when they'd come and take that stuff. Right off for the for, mu for musicians union dudes. Yeah, union halls. That's crazy. Armadillo, Armadillo headquarters was a union hall. Wow. Did you know uh, Danny Freeman? 
I didn't know him. No. Okay. I was curious. I of, course, just, of course, I've heard of him. Sure, sure. I, I had interviewed him in a while back, and his interview actually came out today. So I was just curious. I was like, "Wow, do you know?" Let, let's see how how many coincidences we could find on this call here, man. That's been yeah, wow. That's pretty cool. That's great, man. What, what's some yeah. good stories? Yeah, I can still see him ducking behind there. It's like kids or something, you know. Um. What are some, is there one or two particular things that you did at the time that was out of your comfort zone, but turned out to be really nice breaks? Lead breaks? No, not lead breaks. I mean, uh, like things that you did career wise, which were you're uncomfortable with in the beginning, but they really turned into like good moves for you. Like were you uncomfortable going to England and doing Mayall, for example? No, uh, I was a little uncomfortable wondering because I'd heard such horror stories with uh, Tommy Bolin, uh, Johnny telling me about his brother Tommy, how they just, you know, where's Richie Blackmore when he got it deep purple? You know, oh, you're, like you didn't get kidding me. Well, yeah, you know, when Richie, Richie, you know, when you're a new guitar player, that doesn't yeah. feel. Uh, no, it's got to be hard. And I was kind of worried, wonder if that'll happen with Mayo. Oh, okay. You know, because he had a line of really good guitar players, but never did. I was, I was, you have nothing to fear, but fear itself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Oh, that's no, great. Like, I just fit in and it's like, uh, the crowd accepted it. And they had a few people that may have liked a certain guitar player better and they've got that right. You know, yeah. um, <clears throat> but everybody does things different. We all have different approach. Sure. Different fingerprint. And, uh, so, that, but I did, that was heavy on my mind before my first tour. Sure. That, that's totally, <coughs> totally understandable, man. Is there any advice that you would have given yourself, Rocky, like younger Rocky Athos, any advice you would have liked to have from yourself that might've made something about your career or your life easier? Well, probably to, uh, not have worried about playing so many gigs at a young age, trying to make the light bill. Right. I should have poured that money into uh, doing demos or at least somewhat of a master recording and focusing more on that and getting attention from the people I needed to get attention from instead of, you know, uh, we need to buy a PA. We need to buy a truck, you know, like that's going to do anything for you. Yeah. You know, it's going to get you to the next gig. So, you know, you kind of get hung up on that circle of doing those gigs over and over and over. So if I could tell my young self, it would be, who cares? Sure. Get a product out that represents you and get a deal. You know? And, uh, of course, nowadays it's a little different with record companies and stuff. Oh, yeah. It's a whole other story. We don't have to get off into that one. <laughs> no, no, no. Um. As far as guitars right now, what's your go-to, your number one? You've mentioned a few of them. Well, my I love my 52 gold top that's been uh, converted. Wow. Converted? What do you mean? Well, it's got real PAFs on it, and somebody did a solid cherry face on it like uh, George Harrison had uh, you know, on the Let It Be album. Mm -hmm. My son actually found that guitar for me when I was out on the road and said, you're going to like what I just got. So I had to buy it from my son. He goes, <laughs> I knew you were going to want this. So I just went in and bought it. <laughs> that's really nice, man. So, it's, it's great. Yeah, so that's kind of my go-to guitar that. And the one I play a lot live is my 59 Gibson historic. I probably photographed with that a whole lot more. Um, and uh, then my 1960, Fender Stratocaster. My son found that for me too. <laughs> Where? Where'd you get that one? Uh, well, at the time, my son was the manager of a pawn shop. He'd worked himself up to getting in a good position. And that's one of the perks of being in a pawn shop. That shit just. Oh my off. God. Yeah. You know, and he goes, Oh God, this thing is beautiful. So they didn't buy it. They just let me buy it. They called and said, You can get it if you want it. And I said, Yeah. I'd love to have it. So you just paid whatever the cost to buy the guitar off the person was. Wow, what a deal. Yeah. What, a, what, what color? Is it a, a burst? No, it's a uh, – it was refinished. 
every single thing else on it's original. Pickups, pick you know, whatever, everything else. <laughs> I don't what is that? What are that? What do those early pickups sound like? Gosh, God, they're just unbelievable. They're so round. They're not thin. And I think that's why Stevie's tone was so good because he had fifty nine pickups in his, and this is a 1960. And I can't tell if mine are fifty eight through sixty because they've just got so much gunge underneath that I just. Don't want to play with them too much. No, I can't blame you. But uh, they are super fat. They sound so much better than the Strats in the seventies. And there's times you can almost get a Les Paul sound out of that front pickup, you know. But it's just a fat, round sound. And uh, <clears throat> that slab board, you know, is just something else. But it's been refinished to a uh, surf green. Oh, I love that color, man. Yeah, it's in my video dictator. I used it. It's got the split on the pit guard where it's broke, you know, and, and where the, I guess the the, the pit guard shrinks or something. That's you know, great, man. Through the years. Wow, so you got some great guitars. Yeah, I uh, I love doing that. I still collect guitars. I, but, you know, it's just having. It's like if you're a painter, you've got different kind of brushes. Sure for certain things well that's how i look at a guitar that's why i even own a rickenbacker there's got to be something where that'll sound cool you know what's the best guitar you've ever owned and do you still have it no i don't have it anymore i had my 1958 cherry sunburst and uh i thought i was through playing les pauls at one point which can you imagine that no (laughs) <laughs> I can't either, but I talked myself into thinking that I was only digging like strats and stuff, which is fine. I still love those. Sure. Obviously. But boy, the second I sold it, I started missing it. Really? Yeah. And, you know, as time went on, you know, then who's going to pay 250 grand for a Les Paul? Yeah. Right. Oh, my God. You know, but I I, I sold it and kind of wished that I'd have hung on to it because I knew I wasn't going to get another one. Yeah. I think Greg's Greg's got a a fifty eight burst as yeah, well. Yeah, he's got a real one. Yeah, and it's uh, uh, it's it's beautiful too. It's faded nice. Looks yeah. nice. Yeah. Um, Desert Island Discs, man. What's that? Desert Island Discs. Top three CDs or records that you know. If you had to go to a desert island, what would you pick? Oh, that's what you said. Okay, yeah, yeah I remember seeing that question. In in no particular order, and just for today, okay. you know. Can I add two to the one category? Man, you could do whatever you want. Okay. Disarelli Gears. Cream. Cream. And uh, Wheels of Fire. <laughs> Great. I just listened to a Cream run. Like, Do you batch listen by any chance? Like, I tend to, like, I'll go through all the Cream stuff, and then I'll get oh, back yeah. to, yeah, okay. I don't listen yeah. to, like, a little bit of this. I'm, yeah. I'm on a kick of this now. I'm on a kick of. Yeah. And get my Beatle records out and go, I'm in the mood. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I want to write a new song. Let's see if I can come up with something cool. Um, but to me, Crossroads, that live performance that Clapton does on Wheels yeah. of Fire, mm-hmm. is single-handedly the most perfectly executed and sound lick I've ever heard. That whole song. It's like, whoo, he really hit it good on that one. Yeah. You know, because uh, – I've heard other versions of this crossroads and you go, it's still good. Yeah. That one had some kind of melody content going on in it. Well, you yeah. Know? Jack Bruce, that didn't hurt. And then Ginger Baker. I mean, come on, man. Those. Yeah. Uh, that didn't hurt the performance either, you know? So, and you know, it's kind of hard to say my favorite albums, but I, I still love Leslie West. You know, what's funny. I was wondering how much of an influence he was. Cause I was listening to Leslie on the way home from the gym today, and I said, "Man, it sounds. I wonder if Rocky digs him because you're. I know you're a tone guy, and your tone is not dissimilar to his." Well, I always loved his playing. I always thought he had a great vibrato and a great tone, so I learned a lot from that. And of course, I was young, and you know, the first time I heard Mississippi Queen, I was like, "Oh my God, is that strong?" And uh, and then, of course, hearing the first couple of first three Hendrix albums are just how are we going to beat that? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now I love all the new stuff too, but I'm really more about the song. 
And if you go back and you listen to some of those classic albums, man, the songs were great. Yeah. That was Cream it, Records, man. I mean, that's. I mean, World of Pain, songs like that by Cream. You yeah. Go, oh, oh, that's awesome. I, Wow, you put a lot of thought in that, and it shows. It just got something, you know. And it's not just thrown together. And let's do a quick shuffle, and you play a lead here. I'll do a lead, then you sing the "My Baby Done Left Me Now." Let's just go on home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's. I like Cream's great. A really good band. I love them. I actually put a lot of thought into it, and you know, those kind of things are fine for a jam when you're just expressing yourself. They're actually quite a bit of fun. But if you're going to make a record, I kind of feel like you should try to say something in the song, in the mm -hmm. lyrics, that it's a connection of yourself. Sure. Or that you can connect with somehow and to make sure, like we said earlier, make sure the vocals breathe and has good melody and then you got a good song. Even Hendrix, as much as he played, stuff was breathing. You know, he, there was room there for the vocals. It was never, yeah, very yeah, much like so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just, he was very, very, uh, a lot of room for the vocals there, man. I know those are vintage stuff, and I was real, real young when they came out. But because my brother was eight years older than me, seven and a half years older, I could have been 10 years old, but I was still digging on it because that's what my brother liked. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't afford records, but he could. Sure, He's sure. Like in college, and I was like going, what is this? He'd say, sit down, son, and I'll show you. That's funny. <laughs> um, I'll never forget when he put on Mississippi Queen. I was like, what was that? <laughs> Man, you know what I dug? I liked, um, you ever hear a theme for an imaginary Western? Best, one of the best lead breaks ever. Ever, man. You Voiced know it beautifully. And that last little stinger he does on the. Oh, yeah, when he has a, puts a harmonic. The bow, yeah. bow, 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 it's, it's in B, B, B minor pentatonic. I think he's playing or something like something that. Like that. Yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Unbelievable. You know, a great, you know, I'll tell you, it's funny. My older son, he's 28. And when he was, when I went to the hospital with him, uh, you know, I had a boom box. So this is back in a little bit, you know, not a massive one, but just a little one. And uh, I made a mix, a tape of songs that I said, okay, I'd be really happy if he was born to any one of these songs. And that was the one he was born to, Theme for an Imaginary Western. So now whenever we're in the car, of course, I'm not in the car with him much anymore now, but whenever that song comes on and we're together, it's like a very special moment for us, That's you know? Cool. Yeah, it's really cool. In fact, and I, I, man, I wanted to interview Leslie and I, I got referred to him but man his manager kept stopping me and i even told him the story i'm like dude if i tell you this story i mean that's got to be worth some freaking credits and the guy just never got but I've, I've spoke to a few people that said the guy's hard to to handle i love leslie's tone you know yeah yeah he's a interesting fellow i did a lot of tours with him oh really yeah when i was in black oak arkansas and lightning and uh he was very friendly with me but there were a couple nights when he was not in the mood. Yeah, yeah. Was he? You know, uh, and, and, and he's easy to read. Like, I can tell he doesn't want a lot of, he's not, he obviously doesn't want company right now. He's barking everybody's head off. Yeah, 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 right. <laughs> but that's, still, that, he was never rude to me, not once. That's awesome. Still, though, just a terrific lead player, I and, think. I agree with you, man. Incredible. Very soulful cat. Very soulful guy. Yeah. Most important things you've learned about yourself, Rocky, throughout your career experience and life in general. Okay, easy enough to actually stay true to the art form that you love, um, whether that be rock blues or blues or rock. Let's just say you're a straight ahead rocker. If that's what you're feeling in your heart and soul, go for it. Um, <clears throat> I just feel like staying true to what you're feeling. What, what makes you happy when you hear music? What songs did it for you? That's where you're going to play your best. And that's my opinion. Man, you know, um, I have to tell you, I have asked a lot of people that question, and that is a very common answer. And it has inspired me over the last year that I've been doing these to change my attitude and, and be more like that because I see the joy that that has created for so many people. Right. And, right. You know, and as you get older, that – that, having that joy in your life, as you know, becomes much more important to you. Yeah. You know, in the very first concert I ever went to, 
period. I was in the seventh grade, and my mother was a beautician. She was the one that was really behind us a lot musically, me and my brother. Mm. And uh, she said, a lady came in and gave me tickets, if we wanted to, to go see a B.B. King. Oh, my God. And my brother was like, what? <laughs> that was my first concert was B.B. King. Seventh grade. That's pretty and, cool. Uh, I sat right in front of him at the Losers Club in a little round table drinking a cherry Coke because my mother was there so I could get in. Right. And I remember asking my brother, what's he doing when he does this? You know, Keith Richards doesn't do that. What is that? He said, it's vibrato, man. I went, huh? <laughs> First time I ever saw that. Then many years later, when I went to tour – with John Mayall, we did several tours with B.B. King, and I told him that story. I saw you play. Of course, you won't remember me. I was a little punk in the crowd, sitting right in the front row. But I saw you in Dallas, and he goes, at the Losers Club? I went, yes. And he goes, on Mockingbird Lane? I said, how would you ever remember that? And he goes, I remember all my gigs, man. Wow. I thought that was totally cool. And then he That's started really talking cool. about the, the club and stuff and how he was part of the Dallas Mafia or whatever. And I said, That's weird because I played there when I became a teenager. And that was the word. Be careful. You know, you got to do your sets just right. This guy's in the Mafia. Oh my God. That's hilarious. <laughs> and we had to wear slacks. I got sent home because I wore a pair of jeans to the gig. And he oh, goes, you had to wear you turn around and you go put on some slacks. That's wild. <laughs> So, yeah, I had to go home and put on slacks. I was like in the 10th grade playing with some older guys that got a gig there. And Man, uh, I got to tell you, so somebody cool. I interviewed recently told me that they sat – they were at that concert and they sat on stage with B.B. afterwards. And he just – I got to tell you who this is. And he talked to him. And, and I'm just – this is like in the last week or so. Um, uh, oh, you know who it was? Anson. Do you know Anson Funderburg? We're probably at the same place. He, it ha- he lives. It, it had I, to be because well. yeah. So I interviewed Anson last week, and he told me this story because I remember he said the Losers Club. Like, Man, there's a place called the Losers Club in just called Losers in Nashville. And then he said he sat on stage with BB after the show, like people were just walking by, and. He didn't even know Anson. It wasn't like he had a hookup. Anson just went up there and said, excuse me, Mr. King, or whatever. And he just sat there talking to him about guitars. And he said he made him feel like he was the most important person on he did earth. did do that. B.B. King was good at that. When I played with Mayall, we all went in the room. We were talking to him. And when everybody was leaving, John, all the other guys in the band, he said, Rocky, come here. And I shut the door, and it was just me and BB. And he said, "I only do this to guitar players I respect." But he goes, "I want to give you my pick." <laughs> and in turn, I want your pick. He goes, "I only do that with guitar players I respect." Very I've cool. On, I've got it on my wall, right over there. Man, that is so cool. What a good story. But uh, yeah. yeah, so Anson, it, so it he, came out his hands while he was playing backstage, and I went, "Well, I'm keeping that." <laughs> yeah, man. What a, he sounded like a real class act. Oh, man, he was awesome, you know, and it was just cool for him to remember every little thing about that club and that gig. And Here, here's, a, here. here's a funny B.B. King story. I interviewed a, a session player, a top guy in Ireland, actually. His name is Anto Drennan. He played with Mike and the Mechanics, Genesis, and he's out on – played with the Coors. Anyway, he played – there was some big event he was playing, and he opened for B.B. And after the show, B.B. comes up to him. And he says, I just want to tell you something. He goes, you moved me tonight. Yeah. You really moved me. And he's feeling like, oh, my God, I can't believe this. He's talking. And then like a few minutes later, he sees BB talking to another musician. And he goes, I just want to tell you, you moved me tonight. And he said, he, he goes, I was so disappointed. He goes, not that he wasn't being sincere, but, you know, I felt like. I was really special. And then, well, if anything, he was making everyone feel special. And, you know, he was right. really he was right. really a really kind man. Yeah, to do all that stuff. I mean, just to even to consider all that to how to make others feel, that's a pretty selfless thing to do in the midst of you got a million things going on, you're playing a show, you got fans, you, you know, but to go that, that's a pretty selfless person, man. That's really cool, I think. 
yeah, it was really pretty cool to do that and have him remember it. I said, of course, you won't remember me. I'd be floored. <laughs> Why would you do that? But because I was only in the seventh grade, I think my mother made me wear a tie. You know, like we had to, I had a white shirt on and a little tie, like, well, I guess I'll That's do whatever funny. it takes to be me. Oh, absolutely, and, man. You know, if your mother's taking you, you better, you know, put on your good clothes. <laughs> hey, man, I'm going to ask you three more questions, Rocky, and I can't thank you enough for your time. Um, absolutely. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you very much. Uh, person who's had the biggest influence on your life musically and personally? Well... Believe it or not, it'd be my brother, Nick Athos. Um, now, he didn't go professional on guitar, but he stayed with it when I might not have been all that interested in, in learning. <clears throat> and he's the one that, you know, kind of introduced me to, to blues and Muddy Waters and then the Stones and the Beatles. And, you know, it just I kind of was a sponge for all of that great music he played in the bedroom because we had to share the same bed for all those years. You know, we, we weren't rich or anything. And at night we used to play music to go to sleep by. And, uh, boy, when I hear some of those songs, it takes me right back to being in that bedroom and what it meant. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I'm really glad that he bothered to show me how to play guitar. Cause I think I was pretty stubborn at times. <laughs> is, uh, is he living near you still? Well, he lives pretty close. He lives about 30 miles away, but... Uh, Did y'all get to yeah, hook we, up? We do all the time. Oh, yeah. that's great, man. He's my brother, and I love him. Uh, he just got off into a whole different kind of, uh, you know, thing, and that's what he, he does. He's kind of in the business world, and that's, you know, where he ended up. But if it weren't for him, I would never have learned how to play guitar, especially bar chords. Awesome. Shout out to Nick Athis. That's great, yeah. man. Do you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? Well, I love collecting guitars. First that's, off, that's, collecting that's, guitars is awesome. I like building models. Oh, cool, man. What kind of models? Well, World War II planes, things like that, that that's I'm in really the mood cool. to do, you know. Um, haven't done one in a while, though. Maybe I'll go get one. <laughs> there you go, man. Uh, and uh, just hanging out with my wife. And my kids. That's and my how, long, how long have you been married? Uh, 32 years. Man, God bless you. That's awesome. Very cool. And yeah. how many kids do I have? 75. <laughs> <laughs> we've got that's three we've got, a year. <laughs> I'm just yeah, like, work, we've been very busy, Craig. I'm working the math on that. <laughs> <laughs> that look on your face is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> no, we've got uh, a daughter, and then I've got. Uh, other kids from my first wife. Very cool. So I've got a, another daughter and my son who grew up to play bass. That's great, and man. Turned out to be a really slamming little bass player, man. That's awesome, you man. Can, you can see him on the video, Dictator. He's, I'm gonna, I circle Dictator. I'm going to go watch it. Uh, yeah, he never leaves the groove ever. Man, would he had a good teacher. Once he locks into the groove, he's not letting go. He's like a bulldog, man. I mean, <laughs> okay, this is the groove. I'm sticking with it. Great. <laughs> so I love that. He never, you know, gets crazy. And where, where are we going now, you know? I hear you, man. That's great. That's good that you can play with your son. That's really nice. And last awesome. question, man. Best advice you've ever been given? Um, when I saw that, when you wrote that question, I went, what would I say on that? But I thought it'd come to me. I guess the, the best advice came from like Joe Walsh, Leslie West. These are, these were personal things that were said to me is to always think of the song first. What does the song need? If you're talking about music, and that's what I assume to think of what's best for the song. What's this? Like, in other words, the best advice was it's always about the song. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I, I should have asked you about Joe. Did you open for Joe? Is that what, how you know him? Well, I had played with, with Joe Walsh um, on several occasions with my group. Wow. 
But when we were recording the last album I did with John Mayall, mm. he came in and played with us on the album, and it was really cool to to work with him. And we even did a, a harmony lead together, which was like, whoa, this is cool. It's, it's not quite as good as the one on Hotel California, but still, <laughs> it's like going, hey, man, this is a pretty neat little riff we're doing together. He's just a funny guy, great to know, and uh, – when he came to Dallas, he said, come on out. And we, me and the family took the family out there and we oh, backstage so nice, man. a bunch of pictures of us backstage with him and stuff. But he was, uh, as kind as he could be, man. What a, what a great guy really was. But I thought that was great advice. It's gotta be a good song. It's always about the song. Um, whatever that good song needs, you have to sacrifice or add to it. Like, in other words, like we were talking about earlier, if hmm. there's too much rhythm going on and you're not letting the vocals breathe or letting the vocalist sing, cut back. Even if it's all you're doing is going da da da. Yeah. Da da da. If that vocalist is soaring, then, you know, a lot of guys will walk all over that stuff and, and uh, not even know that's what they're doing. And I thought being told that by. Both Leslie West and him. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. You know, Leslie, he, West, Leslie West told me that when my band Lightning was opening up for him at a place called Madcap Molly's in Dallas. And uh, he had, he said that we were out in the parking lot. It's kind of weird. That it, and it stuck with me ever since. You know, it's just a great advice. And then he said this, too. All you ever need is one good song. <laughs> <laughs> Back when they have living off of it. Well, like, Mississippi Queen, yeah. Yeah, it could be a pretty good one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Joe's such a talented guy. I don't think people realize that on those uh, early Joe Walsh albums of Barnstorm, he was playing rhythm. He was playing lead. He was playing acoustic. He was playing electric. He was playing steel. He was playing bass, keyboards, and he wrote all the songs. I mean, to, really, dude, that's... Just He's awesome. Now, one time, well, no, I'm not even going to say that. Uh, but uh, he really was super talented. But he's a perfect example of somebody who could just burn on a song. But if need be, he's just going to play. Oh, little. he plays some beautiful stuff, man. But the most important thing he said is when you're putting a song together, let the singer sing. That always stuck with me a little bit, you know. Well, man, I can't thank you enough, Rocky. Let me tell people where to find you. Genuinely, thank you so much, man. I really well, appreciate thank it. So, thank you so much for your time. Uh, everybody, please check out Rocky Athis online. His last album is phenomenal. It's called Shaking the Dust. And I would encourage you to go to his website. It's rockyathis.com, A-T-H-A-S. And Rocky, of course, is R-O-C-K-Y. He's got everything funnels off of there. All his catalog is there, his back catalog. I would encourage you to check it out, buy his music. Um, he's also on Facebook, Instagram, and AG. What is that? That's nothing. What, what, what's your other? I'm like, sure it means Twitter, I guess. What the hell is uh, rock Facebook, Instagram, and AG, which means Twitter, uh, apparently. I mean, maybe I'm on AG and I don't even know it. Yeah. It's a new social media network we're building here at uh, Everyone Loves Guitar. Uh, you're, he's on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and he's a super nice guy. And he's a, If you haven't heard him play, he's a great player, man. He's got Check out his catalog. It's really, really um, fantastic. And um, he's a rock and roll warrior, man, and a blues warrior. Thank you, man. Any final words of wisdom? Uh, yes, there is. It'd be to stay true to the art form that you find that moves you the most. You know, Just stay with that. You know, some of the people may want to take you down this road or take you down that road. But if you stay true to what you're doing, the people will hear it. They'll know it's real. And that's the most important thing is to know that the music you're putting out is real. I agree 100%, man. Everything about you should be real, but yeah, especially if you're a musician. Yeah, exactly. Hey, everybody. Uh, thank you. Rocky, thanks for everything. I appreciate it.
Everybody, I uh, hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. If you did, please share it with your friends on social media. We appreciate your support. Thanks again to Rocky Athis and his lovely wife for helping us put this together, for spending time yes. with us. Your wife's name is, uh, tell me again, I had a Jessica brain. Athis. Je- Jessica Athis. Thank you, Jessica. Yes. Uh, and make sure you go to the homepage of everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list. You'll get advance notice of some of the guests I'm interviewing and uh, have an opportunity to send in some of your own questions. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice. So choose wisely. Be nice. Go play your guitar and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. Thank you.